Welcome to Digication Scholars Conversations. I'm your host, Kelly Driscoll. In this episode, you'll hear part one of my conversation with Beata Jones, Professor of Business Information Systems Practice, Neely Distinguished Teacher, and Honors Faculty Fellow at Texas Christian University. More links and information about today's conversation can be found on Digication's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Full episodes of Digication Scholars Conversations can be found on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Welcome to Digication Scholars Conversations. I'm your host, Kelly Driscoll, and I am so happy today to introduce Beta Jones from Texas Christian University. Welcome. I'm honored to be here, Kelly. Oh, I, I am the one that is honored, my friend. This is just so exciting for me. And for those that are just meeting you, I wanted to let everyone know that you're a professor in the Business Information Systems Practice Program, and you are also an Honors Faculty Fellow. So we'll have to learn a little bit about that today as we're speaking. And um, I also saw a Neely Distinguished Teacher. So are you still teaching in the Neely Business School there at Texas Christian University? I am. I have been since 1995. Okay, awesome. So I want to hear a little bit about first, you know, starting back in the beginning, where you grew up. I find in these conversations with extraordinary educators like yourself that there's always some kind of fascinating history that's kind of led them to where they are today. So I wanted to start there with where you grew up. Oh my, that certainly is an interesting question. I was born in Poland (laughs) and grew up in Warsaw. For the first 19 years, um, Warsaw University dropout, uh, as I often let my students know, especially the students who seem to struggle that there's hope for everybody, uh, (laughs) um, spent um, 12 years and a year and a half in London. Um, That was during the Solidarity Movement and the wall beginning to come down. And then my father lived in New York all all my life. So I joined him after a year and a half in London and spent 12 years in New York from 1983 to 1995. And then since 1995, I have been at Texas Christian University, a fantastic place to be at. So it's been quite a journey in quite a bit of culture change uh, over the years. Yeah. So what kinds of things were you doing in New York and what kind of made you take that leap to moving to Texas? Well, in New York, I was, um, I started my studies. I picked up my studies um, when, where I left them off in Poland. It, It was a different journey in New York at the university than it was in Poland. So I was certainly excited about it. I felt as an overachiever in Poland, I was uh, excited to kind of get going. So I was getting an accelerated, I got into an accelerated program in computer information systems and operations research, doing my BBA and Master of Science in operations research at the same time. And then decided that it was just, you know, I loved school. Uh, I loved what it had to offer. I, after I found my second love, my first love was technology always. So um, finding my passion for education, I decided I would go and pursue a PhD program in New York. So kind of straight uh, from undergrad grad into a PhD classroom. And at the same time, I started teaching at Borough College where I was going Mm. to school. So um, wonderful. It was an interesting journey. Yeah. So what were some of the big differences that you saw in, 
you know, the approach to education in Poland versus what you experienced when you got your studies going again in New York? Oh my gosh, uh, totally different um, in terms of technology. I was, um, I don't want to date myself, but you know, in early 80s, <laughs> I was given in Poland a piece of paper and I was told to write programs. Well, at the time, I read a book about artificial intelligence and expert systems, and I had these uh, ideas that I would be involved in working with artificial intelligence. Of course, that did not happen, and I didn't. I did not have access to technology because we were using fr mainframes. So, coming to the United States and starting my studies uh, in '83, it was just a different idea. We had access to terminals and then eventually to personal computers. So it, it was a different journey. But then in terms of, uh, so technology was uh, a big difference. And the approach, I, I think that um, realizing really the importance of soft skills, communication, how important that is. My, my PhD is in computer science. My, um, I always focused on um, sciences in my studies, math, physics. So realizing how important <laughs> uh, written oral communications are, presentation skills, collaboration, that was not part of my education. Writing, yes, but not really standing up in front of people and talking and being comfortable collaborating uh, on projects that was just never a part of my educational journey. So an adjustment. Yeah. Good yeah. adjustment. Yeah. <laughs> and that definitely has a connection to the kind of teaching that you're doing now and some of the kind of, I mean, through the time that I've known you, which I think is about, 10 years now, these kind of recurring themes that you have in your work with students. So that that's interesting to hear. It sounds like it made quite an impression on you um, when you were doing your studies here in the U.S. And I was also curious, so at that time, um, how many women were in your classes? Maybe in Poland versus in New York at that time? You know, it's in, um, I am not aware that there was a big difference or I was simply not observing that at all. Now that was not my focus. So oh, the gender issue never played for me as a part of, you know, is there a difference? I grew up thinking my mom used to tell me, you know, you can do anything. So um, being a female has never stopped me from pursuing my interest, from um, competing with men. It was not a part of reality that I was considering it. In in pursuit of my dreams, or that's excellent. Realize, trying to realize my plans. That's excellent, and it sounds like you had a lot of um, support from your mother in pursuing this type of education. Was was she interested in technology as well? She was a nurse, so um, technology was definitely not a part of our lifestyle it was not uh, she died uh, about a decade after I left Poland and while I was po in Poland technology you know we had uh, record players and mm -hmm. <laughs> cassette players that was our the extent uh, extent of our technologies and phones stationary phones and in those days so it, it was just a, a a different journey but she was a supporter no matter what so yeah. I was blessed with a supportive mother and that shaped really my journey, uh, my professional journey. Yeah. And then what about your dad too? So what was it like coming here after having spent so much time away from him 
joining him here in the United States. Oh, wow. Um, There's another story there. I met my dad for the first time, really, when I was 12. Then I spent a summer with him when I was 16. It was an adjustment, certainly as a child. You know, you go and sit on this man's lap thinking, he's my dad, but that kind of feels weird. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, he has been... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he has been most supportive as well. He's been my biggest cheerleader, really, through my educational journey um, in New York City, through the City University of New York system. I'm a product of that system, a proud product. Um, they have um, scholarship, my um, doctoral education. So I- I'm blessed again in so many different ways of uh, people who have been there for me. And I think that that's part of, you know, to whom a lot has been given, a lot is expected. So paying forward uh, uh, for students who may not have those mentors is a Mm -hmm. big, uh, big part of who I try to, what I try to do these days. Yes. Yes. And so how did you learn about Texas Christian University? You know, um, when you compete for professional positions at the university, the opportunities are worldwide. So we go to conferences, we interview, and wherever there is a best fit, you go. So my research interests at the time, focusing on group support systems, and my teaching interests align best with Texas Christian University, which is a fantastic, really, place um, place to be at. I fell in love uh, the minute I set my foot on campus and realized how friendly and supportive everybody was. It was a totally different culture uh, coming from New York and prior to that coming from Poland. So I'm... Um, thankful again for the opportunity to to have been a part of that community for so long. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's been nothing but supportive and gave me a lot of opportunities to grow through the years, which is what we all want. Yeah, indeed. And I do have to say, you know, I have visited many campuses and one of my big takeaways from my visits to TCU, you know, I think is that immediacy of warmth and support. And um, there's just this kind of lively spirit there. And, uh, you know, I always (laughs) share this story uh, on some of the first time I visited the campus, you know, I was aware of how many people were wearing purple and thought maybe it was some special day on campus. Maybe they were doing photos and things. And then I discovered that it's like that every day. (laughs) As the school color. We have a lot of spirit. Yes, there's so much school spirit there. And, uh, you know, I learned about the horn frogs, you know, that, that probably sh- shows that I don't follow a whole lot of sports. Uh, otherwise I would have known about them beforehand, <laughs> <laughs> but you can, you can just feel this wonderful excitement and, and connection and spirit around the, the campus and, um, you know, all of my interactions with the the faculty members and the students there have just been wonderfully warm. And, um, you know, I do feel like there's this immediate kind of kinship that happens um, with individuals there. So I can see why you've uh, stuck around there the, all these years. <laughs> I had an opportunity to wear a lot of different hats, which uh, certainly has uh, contributed to making that journey exciting. So, and and growing through the process, e-portfolio being a part of that journey. So, um, as you said, we have known each other for 10 years. I have been in a portfolio space since 2005, taking on 
and role of a director in our business owners program. So our students have been working with uh, paper portfolios since 2005. Uh, and I, I remember even going in 2008 to Campus Technology Conference. I think yeah. that's what it was yeah. called at the time. Yeah. Before able and looking at some solutions, I think, but we ended up not adopting uh, at the university at the time. There was some discussion in 2008, but finally in 2012, that's how I met you. Um, there was a movement to bring ePortfolio to campus and um, I, I was changing roles and moving to the Honors College as an Honors Faculty Fellow and had the privilege of joining the team that was introducing ePortfolio um, implementation to campus. So learning from others, learning from you, learning from the folks on the team and trying to figure out how best to make the implementation process for our students in order for them to be successful uh, was an exciting journey that took a couple of years really to figure out. Yes. And I do think that it was that, you know, I think that you had a wonderful team of people that was very intentional about how they wanted to, uh, you know, that real why behind why they wanted to have students creating e-portfolios. It was a very um, well thought out and intentional plan that the team had put together. And, you know, I was very grateful that that plan was actually shared with me because it demonstrated really the the thoroughness that had been thought through with kind of incorporating this type of technology and the different touch points that it was going to have with students. And I recall in the beginning that it was tightly um, coupled with the habits of mind um, that the, yes. they were very interested in the students using the e-portfolio to reflect on each of those habits of mind as they were um, entering the institution, but also um, with the hopes that they were going to carry that through no matter what major they chose. Um, and that was a really new approach at the time. And um, I was curious uh, because you know, you were teaching in one discipline, other people were teaching in other disciplines, but there was this similar kind of focus as you got started. Could you share a little bit about what it was like in the the early days as you were starting to roll that out? I recall there was a small pilot and then um, things kind of kicked off really at a um, institutional scale from there. So uh, where would you like me to begin at my small pilot level or yeah, at the institution level? Yeah, you can start level? with the pilot. Yeah, start, start in the beginning. Yes. So uh, as I mentioned, I moved from the Neely School for three years to the Honors College. And in 2013, I believe in the fall of 2013, by then we have attended a conference uh, with my colleagues. We talked to a lot of folks and we all have drank the ePortfolio Kool-Aid. We, we <laughs> knew that education was the best platform and the, the best technology for me. And I believe, I still believe that ePortfolio is the next to learning management system that allows us to manage day-to-day -day classroom operation, ePortfolio platform, education specifically, is the next best thing for our students. It, it is such a powerful platform. It, it, and I don't think uh, that a lot of folks out there really realize the potential, or maybe they do... But to realize its full potential, I believe you need to invest a lot 
invest a lot mm-hmm. of time into technology implementation and guidance. So that is, um, that's key, key learning that we learned. Because mm-hmm. um, after I drank the Kool-Aid at the ABLE conference, so, <laughs> and I was so enthused, and I thought, of course, if I'm going to build this opportunity for my students, they will embrace it uh, enthusiastically because how couldn't they, right? It has <laughs> so much potential. So we have... Um, as you mentioned, we have built a t- portfolio template uh, around our habits of mind and the four habits of mind that we were promoting across the university had to do with our university mission. So looking at ethical leadership, responsible citizenship in a global community. So uh, all those habits of mind were built into the portfolio for students to reflect. One would think that education, no matter what major, students are going to be at a university that has a mission to focus on these elements, is going to enable the students to be able to develop in those areas and tie the experiences that they have in the classroom to these habits of mind. So uh, that was our template that we developed and we were excited about it. At able, at my first able, um, I, I coming from the field of business information systems, I noticed that there was something missing in the current implementations. There was, um, you know, uh, up to that point, uh, I spent last two decades focused on with students on or are partly focused on web development and best practices mm-hmm. in web development. And I was not seeing some of those best practices implemented in some of the portfolios because they were maybe done for assessment purposes and right. you mm-hmm. really did not need those elements of focusing on external audiences when you build your portfolios for assessment purposes, which is for internal consumption. So when we put together our guidelines for implementation of the early portfolios, there was a big element of focus on digital storytelling. Mm that was telling your story in a digital medium, right? And focus also not only on the internal consumers of the portfolio that you put together, but also on the external consumers' potential. So it could be the counselors at grad schools where students apply, potential employers. Um, It was key, key difference that we noticed in terms of the guidelines that we put together for our students, how they were going to communicate um, and reflect upon uh, their learning experiences. So it wasn't only done for assessment purposes, but also for the benefit of the students to be able to reflect upon their learning and provide them a compass. And then also for external audiences, where, you know, it could be helpful for the students to be able to be found, to be, to be able to tell their story better, right? So in my, uh, the first, um, my first journey was in an honors colloquium called um, Disruptive Nature of Information Technology. And in that particular course, based on inquiry-based pedagogy. So um, I I was really doing a couple of different things in this honors colloquium. We were, uh, students were leading me on journeys into areas that I was not an expert. So I had to find them an expert uh, because they were embracing topics like um, how can we use technology to help with eating disorders or Mm -hmm. uh, help promote music education. So I'm not an expert in that. Uh, So they were working on 
research projects and using a portfolio platform to help with those research projects with collaboration. And um, there was, uh, I was actually surprised in preparation for today's meeting. I looked at the education statistics and that portfolio has received 20,000 views. I, I was really shocked uh, um, to see um, that the work that we did back in the fall of 2013 has, in the past decade, has, you know, gotten some traction, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that has been useful for, for some somebody out there to be able to see and learn how ePortfolio platform can be used as a part of the course. So we also, we had a learning management system that we were using for grading and other purposes, but we were also using the ePortfolio platform to make our learning visible and to be able to collaborate easily on, on, on the projects that we were researching. Students would provide feedback to each other more easily and share their artifacts with the world. So that was, in addition to that use of ePortfolio, we thought, okay, we're going to roll out for the first time our Habits of Mind template and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. um, so that was in lieu of a final exam. And students felt like it was an add-on to the course. Like, why are we doing this? And I thought, what a great opportunity. You can tell the world your story. But I did not have experience. I did not know how to communicate with students in a way that would make this project appealing for them. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would try something else uh, in the fall of 20, I'm sorry, in the spring of 2014. I tried a different approach, different honors colloquium that was focusing on development, really on developing the framework, the course for the university um, template that we would be using. So we were trying to come up with best practices yeah. uh, and resources for students to be able to use when developing the portfolio. So I have, mm, having had some experience with my, with the course in the fall, I realized that I, I need some help. So I have reached out to a colleague in the English department by the name of Carrie Leverance, who was at the time a co-leader, co-director of our New Media Writing Center, now called the Center for Digital Expression. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, I worked with that center. Uh, they put together a, a guide for how to write for the web that I used in my classes in business information systems. So I thought, well, oh, this is all... Oh, fine, but we need a different resource that talks about how you use digital storytelling, because that's what a portfolio that focuses externally is really telling your story, yeah. and do it for the web. So how Carrie developed a digital storytelling e-portfolio about digital storytelling with e-portfolio. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, again, uh, this portfolio I noticed had eighteen thousand views. So yes, again, it's a resource that has been available. well, yes, it was available, and it was critical for our students in knowing kind of what is expected, right? Uh, it was an exemplar uh, at the time for the students. So what we we had that resource and with the entire focus of the course in the fall of, in the spring of 2014 was on creating digital identities so the entire course focused on e portfolio instead of being an add-on 
do a, a, instead of the final exam. It was an entire course. It was titled uh, Digital Storytelling Across Disciplines. Mm -hmm. So digital identity and digital storytelling across disciplines. And we were focusing in a very intentional way of first establishing an identity. So we had students enrolled from across campus, from sophomore through senior level. And they were in a, a various points in terms of their understanding what journey they were on. Yes. So we went through several steps, helping them go through that inquiry process, mentoring them about what, you know, how to connect the dots, mm -hmm. uh, asking them questions, asking the students to reflect upon the inquiry process, the mentoring sessions that we have had, and, and then um, integrating everything. So that was the the first part that uh, we were doing, and there were worksheets. It, there's a there's a paper by Jones and Leverance in the Journal of the International Journal of Portfolio in the first issue in 2017 that actually talks about digital story, digital storytelling in portfolios and our journey to get to that point and has uh, all sorts of helpful, helpful worksheets that yeah, we'll you know, we share came up with. We'll share a link to that in our show notes so that people can yes. find that because it's extraordinary. This concludes part one of our conversation. To hear part two, be sure to subscribe to Digication Scholars Conversations on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Digication Scholars Conversations is brought to you by Digication, a technology platform powering the most innovative e-portfolio programs in K-12 and higher education. Our website can be found at digication.com. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks for tuning in.